Epilogue. The sign said welcome to Tree Gap, but it was hard to believe that this was really Tree Gap. The main street hadn't changed so very much, but there were many other streets now, crossing the main street. The road itself was black-topped. There was a white line painted down its center. May and Tuck, on the seat of a clattering wooden wagon, bumped slowly into Tree Gap behind the fat old horse. They had seen continuous chain and were accustomed to it. But here it seemed shocking and sad. Look, said Tuck. Look, May, ain't that where the wood used to be? It's gone. Not a stick or stump left. And her cottage, that's gone too. It was very hard to recognize anything, but from the little hill, which had once lain outside the village and was now very much a part of it, they thought they could figure things out. Yes, said May. That's where it was, I do believe. Of course, it's been so long since we was here, I can't tell for certain. There was a gas station there now. A young man in greasy overalls was polishing the windshield of a wide and rusty Hudson automobile. As May and Tuck rolled past, the young man grinned and said to the driver of the Hudson, who lounged at the wheel, Looky here, in from the country for a big time. And they chuckled together. May and Tuck clattered on into the village proper, past a Catholic mixture of houses, which soon gave way to shops and other places of business. A hot dog stand, a dry cleaner, a pharmacy, a five and ten, another gas station, a tall white frame building with a pleasant veranda, the Tree Gap Hotel, family dining, easy rates, the post office, beyond that the jailhouse, but a large jailhouse now, painted brown, with an office for the county clerk. A black and white police car was parked in front with a red glass searchlight on its roof and a radio antenna, like a buggy whip fastened to the windshield. May glanced at the jailhouse, but looked away quickly. See beyond there, she said, pointing. That diner. Let's stop there and get a cup of coffee. All right? All right, said Tuck. Maybe they'll know something. Inside, the diner gleamed with chrome and smelled like linoleum and ketchup. May and Tuck took seats on rumbling swivel stools at the long counter. The counterman emerged from the kitchen at the rear and sized them up expertly. They looked all right. A little queer, maybe, their clothes especially, but honest. He slapped a cardboard menu down in front of them and leaned on the foaming orangeade cooler. You folks from off? he asked. Yup, said Tuck, just passing through. Sure, said the counterman. Say, said Tuck cautiously, fingering the menu. Didn't there used to be a wood once down there the other side of town? Sure, said the counterman. Had a big electrical storm, though, about three years ago now or thereabouts. Big tree got hit by lightning, split right down the middle, caught fire and everything, tore up the ground, too, had to bull bulldozer all out. Oh, said Tuck. He and May exchanged glances. Coffee, please, said May. Black for both of us. Sure, said the counterman. He took the menu away poured coffee into thick pottery mugs, and leaned against on the orangeade cooler. Used to be a freshwater spring in that wood, said Tuck boldly, sipping his coffee. Don't know nothing about that, said the counterman. Had to bulldoze her all out, like I say. Oh, said Tuck. Afterward, while May was shopping for supplies, Tuck went back through the town on foot, back the way they had come, out to the little hill. There were houses there now, and a feed and grain store, but on the far side of the hill, inside a rambling iron fence, was a cemetery. Tuck's heart quickened. He had noticed the cemetery on the way in. May had seen it, too. They had not spoken about it, but both knew it might hold their answers. Tuck straightened his old jacket, squinting at the weedy rows of gravestones. Oh, excuse me. He passed through the, an archway of wrought, wrought iron curlicues and paused, squinting at the weedy rows of gravestones. And then, far over to the right, he saw a tall monument, once no doubt imposing, but now tipped slightly sideways. On it was carved one name, Foster. Slowly, Tuck turned his footsteps toward the monument and saw as he approached that there were other, smaller markers all around it, a family plot, and then his throat closed, for there it was. He had wanted it to be there, but now that he saw it, he was overcome with sadness. He knelt and read the inscription, In loving memory, Winifred Foster Jackson, Dear wife, dear mother, 1870 to 1948. So, said Tuck to himself, two years. She's been gone two years. He stood up and looked around embarrassed, trying to clear the lump from his throat. But there was no one to see him. The cemetery was very quiet. In the branches of a willow behind him, a red-winged blackbird chirped. 
Chuck wiped his eyes hastily. Then he straightened his jacket again and drew up his hand in a brief salute. Good girl, he said aloud. And then he turned and left the cemetery, walking quickly. Later, as he and May rolled out of Tree Gap, May said softly without looking at him, She's gone? Tuck nodded. She's gone, he answered. There was a long moment of silence between them, and then May said, Poor Jessie. We knowed it, though, said Tuck. At least we knowed she wasn't coming. We all knowed that long time ago. Just the same, said May. She sighed, and then she sat up a little straighter. Well, where to now, Tuck? No need to come back here no more. That's so, said Tuck. Let's just head out this way. We'll locate something. All right, said May. And then she put a hand on his arm and pointed. Look out for that toad. Tuck had seen it, too. He reined in the horse and climbed down from the wagon. The toad was squatting in the middle of the road, quite unconcerned. In the other lane, a pickup truck rattled by, and against the breeze, it made the toad shut its eyes tightly. But it did not move. Tuck waited till the truck had passed, and then he picked up the toad and carried it to the weeds along the road's edge. Dern fool must think he's going to live forever, he said to May. And soon they were rolling on again, leaving Tree Gap behind, and as they went, the tinkling little melody of a music box drifted out behind them and was lost at last far down the road.